Can folks on Zoom hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, it's 9.15, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the November Employee Forum Full Body Meeting. So this is our second hybrid meeting where we have both in-person folks and online folks. So just a reminder for those attending here in person, um, either coming up to the microphone or coming up to the podium, that's how the Zoom attendees will hear you. Um, for those attending on Zoom, just use your raise a hand feature or the chat. And we've got Joe over here that's gonna bring forward comments from the chat periodically. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna welcome Provost Bob Lewin to the stage. He's here with us in person to give our traditional round table and we'll be able to ask questions. So welcome, Bob, come on forward. Thank you, Katie. Um, First of all, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the first time that I've been actually to this uh, facility to, to make my remarks. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief and then open things up for uh, discussions. Um, I, I guess I just first uh, of all would like to start off by uh, thanking uh, the entire uh, uh, community. Uh, we're winding down uh, towards the end of the fall semester. Uh, when we started, I'm not sure that everyone expected us to be in the place that we are, but uh, I think uh, with respect to a few things, uh, we're in pretty good shape uh, that I guess starting first with uh, with COVID and I want to just express uh, my sincere appreciation to everyone who has worked uh, so hard uh, in, in making this uh, fall semester a success uh, for everyone. I also would um, uh, just like to uh, acknowledge that uh, this fall has not been uh, without uh, considerable heartache um, for our campus uh, and the loss of life of uh, several of our students uh, this, uh, this past fall has uh, shocked our campus uh, and, uh, and all of us uh, have uh, in, in one way or another uh, been uh, affected uh, by these uh, tragedies. And, our hearts uh, and prayers uh, go out to uh, uh, all uh, who have been involved and particularly the, the parents and families of, uh, of these students uh, as well as, uh, as their friends. So uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the feelings that I know that so many of you have uh, towards uh, each and every one of them. Um, I, I'd like to start off by just uh, providing a brief update on, on where we are with COVID, um, the, the numbers. We had a meeting yesterday, uh, which included our, uh, our, our, our normal Tuesday morning uh, session, which included uh, a special report uh, and discussion with our campus healthcare experts, uh, particularly from our infectious disease department. Um, the, the numbers look very, very um, positive uh, uh, across the country, across the state, uh, and across the county. Um, if, if you look at numbers of cases, if you look at uh, deaths, if you look at hospitalizations, uh, the trends are all uh, going uh, in the right direction. 
Uh, in Orange County, uh, we're in particularly uh, good shape. Uh, we have one of the uh, lowest uh, uh, densities of viral load. Uh, I think the uh, percent positivity was hovering right around one, a little over 1% uh, for the county. Uh, we also have uh, the fortune of being one of the highest uh, vaccinated counties in the state with 70% uh, of our uh, population being fully vaccinated and about 73% of our population being partially vaccinated. Um, tomorrow uh, marks the opportunity for children uh, the age of five through 11 uh, to get vaccinated. I strongly encourage uh, uh, parents you know, who have children of that age group uh, to, to you know, uh, seriously consider uh, vaccinations. Of course, uh, upon the, with the uh, advice of your pediatrician, but uh, certainly want to encourage uh, all members of our communities who are eligible for vaccinations to get vaccinated. Uh, I, I think also the data with respects to boosters um, is also rather significant and, and positive. Um, I, for one, uh, had uh, received my booster a couple of weeks ago and uh, uh, feel very good about uh, having that. And a lot of the people uh, that I've talked to, uh, particularly the adults uh, within our, uh, uh, our, our community, have taken uh, it upon themselves to pursue uh, booster shots. The data is uh, very uh, significant in terms of the value, not only to yourself, but also th to those around you with respects to uh, getting your booster. So uh, all of the, the, the data uh, is looking very, very good. Uh, our own uh, campus data is also very, looking very uh, favorable. Um, our percent positivity over the last seven days was somewhere around 0.3%, uh, which is, I think, uh, a very impressive uh, number. The number of cases on our campus is very, very low uh, and ranging between zero and six um, over the last uh, uh, 10, 14 days. And so I think we're in a, a pretty good uh, place right now. Um, so uh, the, all of that, uh, I think, uh, speaks well, I think, to uh, the fact that the majority of our campus community has been vaccinated. Uh, the numbers are very impressive. 94% of our faculty, 93% of our students, and, uh, and a growing number of our staff, now 86% of our staff have now uh, attested uh, to their uh, vaccination status. Uh, the combination of low viral load, high vaccination rate, um, a, a very strong community vaccination rate, uh, I think contributes to a, a very favorable, safe uh, environment for all of us to be living, working, and playing in. So I hope uh, that all of this will continue uh, throughout the holidays and uh, look forward to seeing the, the, the data at the end of the year. Um, I know that uh, perhaps one thing that's on many people's mind is the mandate. Um, and um, uh, as, as you know, we're, we're responding to uh, uh, President uh, Biden's uh, federal mandate that um, all, all institutions that receive federal contracts uh, must have a uh, must uh, be responsive uh, to a federal mandate of mandatory vaccinations, uh, and those vaccinations have to be complete uh, by uh, or should be complete by December the eighth to, to be in compliance with the federal law. We receive approximately $165 million through these federal contracts uh, and growing. Uh, and so it is imperative that uh, this university do its very best uh, to comply uh, with, that, with that mandate. Um, we have sent out notices uh, through HR uh, to notify those individuals you know, who are subject uh, to this mandate. Uh, as you know, because of the high vaccination attestations already. Uh, we have the majority of our uh, campus community that has been, uh, have been vaccinated. Uh, now the, the challenge is to make sure that those who have been vaccinated, um, uh, that they upload the um, uh, appropriate documentation uh, uh, into the site that is necessary for uh, human resources to verify uh, that that is an accurate attestation. Uh, and that we can uh, proceed uh, with our uh, documentation consistent with the, the federal uh, guidances. Um, there is uh, yet to be any um, clear um, 
uh, guidance uh, from the UNC system with respects to um, what we will do if uh, individuals do not comply within that timeline. Uh, I know that uh, the timing is uh, an issue for some. Uh, it is our hope that uh, uh, by the, I think, 12th of November that uh, everybody uh, will be uh, appropriately notified and will have the opportunity to upload accordingly. That will give everybody the, the opportunity to then initiate uh, their vaccination regimen, um, uh, particularly with the messenger RNA uh, vaccines, the Pfizer or the Moderna, so that they can get uh, all of their doses in uh, in advance of the December 8th uh, requirement. So uh, uh, still more uh, information is gonna be needed to, to be shared uh, with you, uh, particularly as it relates to, uh, well, what if I don't do it? Uh, and what will, um, you know, what will happen you know, uh, to me if, if that were to be the case? Uh, and we are still um, evaluating uh, what the options you know, might be at that point. Um, we are in the midst of uh, planning for the spring. Um, and so uh, uh, the spring semester will be here before you know it. Uh, and we are looking at um, our community standards to determine whether or not we need to make any adjustments. Um, our healthcare experts tell us that uh, perhaps uh, we could make uh, some adjustments with respect to our testing requirements uh, and that we may uh, be gradually moving away from uh, some of the, the, the testing infrastructure that we have on campus. Uh, we're looking at third party vendors uh, that might be able to provide some uh, testing support in the event that we make the decision to move away from that. We do wanna maintain flexibility, however, uh, in the event that we would have to re-ramp up uh, testing infrastructure within the institution. And, and those uh, considerations are, are being made uh, by, um, by a number of people right now. Um, there also is a, a lot going on with regards to uh, changes in leadership and leadership searches. Um, and uh, we're, we're making progress in all of those. Uh, there's a provost search uh, underway, a vice provost for enrollment search underway. Uh, we're at the tail end of both of those searches. Uh, and we also um, have a number of deanships uh, that are being searched for the School of Nursing, the Global, um, the, the uh, Gillings um, uh, uh, School of Global Public Health, uh, the, the college, uh, the Adams School of Dentistry, as well as the Husband School of Journalism and Media. Uh, all of the, those have search committees in place and uh, we'll be uh, waiting for the recommendations from those search committees uh, over the next uh, several months. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and uh, try to answer any questions that people have. Questions for Provost Will and David, your hands up. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for your time this morning. I'm curious, so there's $160 million for, of federal contracts. Is that specifically contracts or are those grant uh, included with grant money, which, um, my understanding from the mandate is that it's required of federal contractors, but that grant recipients are specifically excluded. Is that accurate? Yeah, my understanding uh, is that that $165 billion uh, number uh, primarily uh, involves uh, federal contracts. Great. That's my impression. So are you saying then that every single university employee is a, working under a federal contract? No, well, I, I, I think what the uh, institution um, has a responsibility to do is to look at every, um, uh, you know, every contract uh, and, and then if, if they were to just look at the contract, um, I think what you would find is that it's not just the PI and the, and the research team, but there's a finance person, there's an HR person, there's an administrative person. There are many people that, that support a federal contract, um, either directly or indirectly downstream from the core research. Um, that trail um, is almost impossible uh, to manage um, at, the, at the ground level. 
And so uh, I, I think what, what most universities are doing is basically saying that that, uh, that that is an impossible thing for us to manage individually and to track each contract and each individual uh, in which that dollar um, you know, has some bearing on the work that is gonna be conducted in order to properly execute that contract. And so the, the position of this university and the position I think of most universities is to take an, an all or none approach. And that is that, uh, that, that all employees uh, would need to be uh, uh, vaccinated in order for us to be able to properly defend and comply with the federal mandate. So I, I understand the essence of your question and, um, and, and there is, a, I think, a little bit of confusion around that. So um, I, I guess you could take the, uh, the federal guidance and literally interpret it and say, well, we will only uh, care about you know, those people who are supported uh, by that $165 million of federal contract. The, the problem is that there are a lot of downstream uh, 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 pieces of work that need to take place to support that $165 million grant. Great, other questions? Yeah, that you're not shy. I have a, are you talking about me? Yeah, I have other questions. If, if you, I don't wanna, I don't wanna hog the floor. I appreciate your time, uh, but I, I don't wanna hog the floor. Is that- hey, David, I just wanna make sure that I, that I uh, uh, adequately answered your question, your first question. I think so. I, I, what I hear you saying is it's, it's too cumbersome for the university system to put in the effort to figure out exactly who qualifies as a federal contractor and who uh, fall, it falls under the category of grant recipients who are excluded. Yeah, that, um, I think, I mean, I get, I think that's what I heard you say. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, as, uh, as I look at it, as a, even, even in my role as a former dean looking at a school, you know, and, and we, we, we get a grant um, and generally we think of the recipient of the grant, the PI and the co-PIs and the, and the staff that work on the grant. We, we, we tend to think that those who are being paid directly are the only ones who, who work on the grant. But what we really know, know is that there are a lot of people behind the scenes that work on that grant. And the federal requirement is that all of those individuals would have to be tracked uh, right. and, and adjusted. So uh, you multiply that by, you know, uh, uh, you take $1 and track $1. Now you take $105 million and try to track uh, each of those dollars. It just becomes uh, too cumbersome. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I, Joe, I don't want to get in front of Joe, but I have some follow up questions after Joe, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, sounds good. Joe, you have a question from the chat, I believe. Yes, a just question from the chat from Teresa Silsby. With the mandate coming, if employees receive a medical or religious exemption from the vaccine, will they still be subject to required testing on campus? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as of right now, uh, they would be. Uh, but we are um, reevaluating uh, things for the spring uh, and our testing protocols uh, in the spring um, could be different than that, what, what they are currently. Um, we, we, we again, uh, we had rather lengthy conversations yesterday uh, with our healthcare experts and trying to discuss, you know, uh, the, the scientific and the healthcare value of uh, mandatory um, asymptomatic testing, regardless of why. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to uh, question whether or not that, that is going to be a particularly uh, useful uh, thing to, for us to, to do on a regular basis. So we'll know more probably uh, within the next two weeks uh, as to whether or not we're going to make a a change in our uh, testing protocols for the spring. Uh, and we'll share that with you as soon as we, we get that information. From Arlene Metter, if an employee has a concern about fellow employee being vaccinated or being unvaccinated, sorry, with the knowledge that it's intrusive to ask, is there best avenue to consult the ombuds office or is there another venue to discuss their concerns with privacy being key? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, you know, obviously uh, 
we we do not have the the right to actually um, you know challenge or ask individuals you know whether or not uh, they are vaccinated uh, or not. Uh, their responsibility is to attest um, and now to document, you know, whether they are vaccinated. Um, and if they are not vaccinated, uh, then based on the federal uh, mandate, you know, they are subject to disciplinary action uh, within the university. Um, you know, if it comes to the attention, you know, of the university that that someone is out of compliance and that was unknown to us, then I suspect that uh, someone uh, from the university would um, approach that individual in a confidential manner without revealing, um, you know, what that uh, what the source of that information was. But but the expectation is that everybody will comply um, who was required to comply uh, and. Uh, uh, and and if, if someone does have a, a, a medical or religious uh, exemption, uh, then we expect that while we still have testing uh, as uh, the alternative uh, to vaccination, uh, we would still expect um, everybody to comply. So our position, I think uh, the university's position will always be that, you know, we have a responsibility to be in compliance with federal and state laws. And if, if that means that we um, need to assure that everybody is vaccinated or is being appropriately tested, then we will comply with that. Um, we we will, will also um, always try to uh, respect, you know, the confidentiality uh, of uh, everyone, uh, particularly where it uh, overlaps into someone's uh, medical record. And we certainly don't want to violate uh, any of those confidentialities. And, we're certainly not encouraging people to um, tattle. Um, you know, we think that the system that would be in place um, would uh, appropriately identify those individuals who are out of compliance. Uh, Bob, just a quick question. Is, is there a timeline for the disciplinary action decisions to be kind of announced and released? Because I think that information is gonna be helpful in the coming weeks. Yes. Um, well, obviously, uh, we need to be in compliance by December the 8th uh, with the federal government. Um, but the, the federal government doesn't necessarily stipulate, you know, what, um, uh, you know, what the disciplinary actions, you know, would be. If you read the law, uh, if you read the law, uh, it implies, you know, that one cannot work, you know, um, with, uh, within the institution consistent with the expectation that only vaccinated people would be engaged in the work of the federal government uh, on these projects. Um, and so that's the implication, uh, but, uh, but, but we really are working uh, hand in glove with the system office. Uh, we have seven, six, 17 universities uh, associated with the UNC system. Um, I, I, I believe that it's important that there's harmony you know, across the universities in terms of how they're going to uh, approach um, these disciplinary actions. And so we're trying to uh, come up with a, a unified approach. So correct me if I'm wrong, it's just us in NC State and maybe a, a couple others in this. Yeah, so, so not everybody um, needs to comply with the federal uh, law because not everybody is receiving uh, federal uh, contracts. NC State and UNC Chapel Hill are the two major players in this, but there are a handful of other universities within the system. Having said that, um, you know, that, that there may be other universities that may want to follow the guidance, you know, that is set for by the, the, the system as it relates uh, to this mandate. So your impression is that the system is gonna be following suit in, in mandating across the whole system? My understanding is that whatever, whoever it, it directly applies to, the system office will be providing some general guidance, you know, for those institutions, and then the institutions perhaps would have the, the flexibility of deciding how they want to handle it. Okay, David, you follow up question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was looking at the dashboard this morning. It says there's a 901 positive cases currently since August, um, and I was curious as a what has any effort been made to assess what percentage of those 901 people were fully vaccinated at the time of their positive test? 
Yeah, uh, we, we do track um, the percentage of individuals um, you know, who, who were vaccinated and who, were, who, who tested positive. Um, I would say that it has evolved. Um, uh, early on, uh, before the majority of the population uh, was vaccinated, obviously, uh, you know, everybody was unvaccinated. But uh, over the last uh, several weeks, you know, right now, the majority of the people, you know, who are testing positive, you know, are vaccinated. Um, the, the, the good news is that uh, most people are um, asymptomatic, uh, or um, if they are symptomatic, they are very mild. Um, I think the, the evidence from UNC Healthcare is striking um, that 85% uh, of the people who are in UNC Healthcare receiving medical attention uh, for COVID are unvaccinated people. Uh, and uh, of all the individuals who unfortunately have passed away from this, uh, from this disease, um, nearly all of uh, those individuals um, are unvaccinated people. Uh, the only individuals who uh, might fall under the vaccinated and, and who have had problems are those who have, are immunocompromised and, have, uh, and or have had other uh, complications of uh, other diseases uh, that have put them at a high risk of, uh, of uh, a bad outcome. So I think the, the evidence, uh, both locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, is very clear with regards to the power of the vaccine to prevent um, individuals from having a, a, a very uh, unfortunate bad outcome. If you don't mind, to be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm very pro-vax. I support the, uh, the vaccination uh, as a concept. I, I personally don't support the mandate. Um, only because um, as a ex you know desert storm infantry veteran I believe in in civil liberties that said I also believe in social responsibility and believe that anyone who has not uh, received the vaccine and has not uh, been infected with and recovered and or have not been infected with or recovered from um, covid they should get that that said I'm I'm curious uh, of the 14 percent of the staff that are currently unvaccinated, has any effort been made to assess what percentage of those people had a natural infection and natural immunity from recovery? And his and as a follow-up sort of to the concept is in the medical exemption realm, um, I would think as a, as a leading research institution, we would be able to, to know um, what the, the numbers are, the people who have been, excuse me, that have, who have not gotten the vaccine, but who have recovered from natural immunity uh, and why, it, or could there be an exemption, a medical exemption made for people in that case? Given there's, yes. my understanding is a great deal of research showing that natural immunity uh, is as strong or stronger than vaccine induced immunity. Yeah, the, um, well, first of all, the federal mandate um, speaks only about vaccinated and not about natural immunity. Uh, we did have a conversation yesterday uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Weber, and Dr. Iran, um, you know, who um, are experts, you know, in this area, and we actually had the, the, that discussion about natural immunity versus uh, vaccination. And and there's no question with regards to what the research is telling us right now, and that is that. Uh, uh, the vaccine is is far more beneficial than natural immunity in preventing uh, bad outcomes, um, and 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 so I, I don't think that there's any um, debate uh, any longer, you know, in the scientific world as to the uh, relative benefit of vaccination versus natural immunity. The combination of um, the uh, vaccination and natural immunity is very, very powerful, just as booster shots are very, very powerful when you have this additive effect. Um, the, the magnitude of difference uh, between natural immunity and um, uh, vaccination uh, in its own right is uh, right around fivefold uh, advantage to uh, the vaccinated. Is that that would be like a breakthrough, right? Isn't the history of vaccine and induced immunity, hasn't it consistently always been the fact, medically speaking, that natural immunity is stronger than vaccine induced immunity in every virus in the history of viruses? Well, I'm this not a virologist. So I, I'm not sure that I'm <laughs> equipped to answer that question. Uh, although I, I, um, I have a, a, a little bit of background in, in, in some of those areas, but um, 
I, I, my understanding is that it depends on the on the virus um, and how the virus affects the, the immune system. You know, we, we're still learning about the, these coronaviruses. Uh, the, they're they're not new. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but but um, this particular uh, virus uh, is uh, relatively new in in the human population, and we're still learning quite a bit about it. We, we, we still don't know, um, you know, all that much about uh, the durability of these vaccinations. Um, you know, one of the reasons why boosters are now being advocated is because there is evidence, particularly from the Israeli research, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, immunity does wane uh, over time. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, you know, it's not uncommon, you know, for flu, you know, that you get a, a vaccine uh, boost every year uh, for those who uh, are involved in, in flu vaccination. So th th there, there, we, we do know um, that a, a, a number of uh, uh, vaccines require booster shots um, and, and that's primarily due to the, the, just the, the scientific data that demonstrates that your immune response uh, does change over time. And then, of course, as you age, you know, your own abilities to uh, respond, you know, to infections does change as well. So, so there's a lot going on here that we still aren't absolutely clear on. And, um, you know, I think we're going to have to just kind of let this play out for a few years to see exactly what we're going to have to do long term to protect ourselves and our communities. Is that it, David? Are you any other questions? Yeah, that's it for, for right now. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Any Thank other you, questions? Anything from the chat, Joe? Nothing. Can you hear me? Okay. We have a question from Josh Tucker. Will the university drop the mask mandate for indoor spaces for employees after the December deadline? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, as of right now, no. Uh, we, we, we plan to continue. This, this also came up in our discussions uh, yesterday with our healthcare experts and none of our healthcare experts uh, are advocating at this time uh, that we uh, eliminate uh, the mask requirement for indoors. Uh, it's very clear, you know, that that is still going to be an important uh, part of uh, protecting. Now, I think as time goes on, as we learn more, um, you know, there probably um, will be uh, a constant reevaluation of, of that. Um, but as of right now, uh, our feeling is that uh, we would still expect um, everybody to, to wear masks um, indoors. This is particularly important, I think, in our classroom spaces uh, where we have high concentrations of students. And it's, if, if we had a, uh, you, you have to remember um, that um, the federal mandate uh, does not apply to uh, undergraduate students. And so we're not in a position uh, to mandate at this time uh, vaccinations for undergraduate students and so uh, that would be the reason why we would need to uh, preserve the mask mandate um, in the spring. Bill, your hands up. Yeah, I just had, a, we had some questions about the EHS um, vaccination portal um, and pulling in something Mary uh, mentioned in the chat, um, asking about if there's something in place to verify the validity of proof of vaccination submitted by employees. Um, I had a related question around, um, it looks as though you can only enter in two doses at this point. So if we've gone through and had a third dose or a booster, um, the university does not need to collect that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Uh, you only have to show uh, evidence that you're fully vaccinated um, um, w within the uh, original uh, vaccination protocol. So if it's the J&J, &J, it was a single dose. If it was a, a messenger RNA, Pfizer or Moderna, it would be uh, the dual dose. And, uh, and HR does have a team of people um, who are actually going to be reviewing um, all of the um, uh, uploads uh, to further verify that they um, appear to be accurate. If 
Your upload has a picture of your dog. Uh, you know, obviously uh, that will not suffice uh, and that would be rejected and we would ask you to come back and provide um, appropriate verification of your vaccination. And Privilege, this is a link I'll add to that, that um, we're gonna be working with EHS and they're gonna be training, um, providing some training on what to look for when we review those. So um, we're not just going in randomly to look at them and just making our best guess. Uh, we'll actually have some training on what to look for to try and do the validation. David, your hands up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was just wondering, <clears throat> will the specifics about what disciplinary action means um, be made clear prior to the specific deadlines for injections, mandatory injections, uh, so that employees can have an inf can make informed decisions about what their personal um, health, 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 <laughs> excuse me, what their personal medical decisions should be. I don't have an answer for that, and I don't know, Link, or if uh, if Becky uh, is on the call, uh, you may have more insight into uh, the timing of this. Uh, but as of right now, it uh, it's just unclear. That's correct, Provost. Uh, Becky's actually at another meeting, unfortunately, isn't able to join this meeting. But yeah, David, it is unclear at this point. We're pressing for it. We know it's important. We know folks need to know the information as well as we do. Um, and so um, it's just unfortunately not clear exactly when we're gonna get that guidance as of yet. Right. So it, I'm just curious then, but we are planning to move forward with fixed deadlines at this point, lacking that knowledge and guidance. Yeah, the deadlines weren't set by us. The, the deadlines are set by the federal government. Um, and so, uh, but uh, if you read the, the legislation, I mean, it's, it's pretty uh, clear, you know, in what the implications are. You know, we, we're just not sure how we would uh, uh, execute on that. Okay, thanks. Any other final questions for the provost? Well, thank you, Bob. Well, thank you. It. Thank you Appreciate for all the work that you're doing. Appreciate it. I actually had one quick question, if, if I may. Sorry. Um, quickly, um, based off the deadlines that have been announced uh, by the government, and which is what we're going off of, staff and faculty would have had to get a, the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine at the latest today, um, or one of them by the latest today, and you've already missed the deadline for one of the other ones, uh, which, le which really leaves the Johnson & Johnson one, which has had the most uh, side effects and most issue issues going across the entirety of the vaccine so far. In my personal family, my family has had issues with the Johnson & Johnson one. Um, and so now I, I feel like I'm left. If I were to get the, the vaccine, I would be past the deadline based off the deadline that's been stated. So it, it, going to David's point, is there going to be some sort of communication that's sent out soon? Um, because I don't feel comfortable getting the only vaccine that's kind of left for me to get it within the deadline. Yeah, well, again, I'll, I'll turn the link for more specificity, but I believe in the communication that uh, the chancellor and I and Becky uh, McGinney uh, sent out, um, you know, we were pretty clear in that. And, and the way the, the individual dates were laid out, it was, in, it was to give everyone uh, notification that uh, in, in order to comply with the December 8th deadline and also to have a two week um, uh, buffer, you know, because the, the, the requirement is not only um, the three weeks or the four weeks uh, after the Moderna or the Pfizer uh, pro last product is given, but um, also you're, you're not defined as being vaccinated until two weeks after your last dose of, uh, uh, of your regimen. And, and so uh, that was all laid out in that communication. Um, I, I think perhaps though, Josh, to um, uh, another way of looking at your, your comment, um, and, and Link, help me with this if I'm saying something uh, out of turn, but 
certainly, I think there would be uh, a, a little bit of margin of error here. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we would certainly want to make sure if you had a, a, a good reason um, and, and, and or you were uh, late in, in getting your second dose uh, and to comply with the December the 8th, that there would be um, some uh, level of uh, forgiveness, I think, with regards to, to that. So, I, Link, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that we're going to be working very hard to try to make sure we're, we're in complete compliance, but I, I think there is likely to be a little bit of wiggle room um, if, if someone is off by a few days. Yeah, I, I concur with that, Provost. I mean, there, there's, I don't think any interest in anybody watching the clock, so to speak. So as soon as the clock strikes uh, on the deadline date that um, HR folks are mobilized to try and you know, track down non-compliant folks. That's just not something that anybody's interested in. And, and certainly, um, you know, I think flexibility as much as we can will be allowed. I think we're, we're primarily looking for good faith effort here. So you had a question from the chat. I have one more question from uh, Lynn Farrar. Could the notification be sent out or could the notification sent out be provided in Spanish as well? I don't see why not. Uh, again, uh, uh, Link, maybe we can talk about that after uh, after this call. You bet. Okay, good suggestion. Okay. Thanks again, Provost Dealing. Appreciate okay, it. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have special presentations. Um, the first is from the university librarian and vice provost, Elaine Westbrooks on the university library budget cut. Elaine, welcome. Thank you. Um, I have to apologize. I, I hope my, um, I come through clearly. I'm in a hotel room in Cleveland, Ohio <laughs> and the internet connection is not great. Um, but I appreciate this opportunity to speak with all of you. And I just wanted to, um, share what I think is really some challenging news, um, but I wanted to provide an opportunity to talk about um, how the deep cuts to collections um, might impact um, many of you. And so um, you all recall that in January, every unit in the university was expected to make a cut and the library was no exception. And um, we um, were confronted with the and we've decided that um, this cut will come um, in our collections. And so we are planning a $5 million cut in our collections. And again, this is not something any librarian or anybody in the library um, would like to do. This is really a challenging time for us. And nobody gets up in the morning wanting to collect, cut collections that we know that our students, faculty, and staff need. And so um, just to give you some background, the reason we're at this point now is um, it's really the confluence of three um, challenges. The first is, the, of course, the cut um, that we've been um, asked to make. Secondly is inflation. Um, the cost of journals are... Um, incur this amount of inflation year after year, and that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then third is the exorbitant cost of journals, and they are growing at a rate that far outpaces um, gross national product. And it, it's just, it's, it's out of control. And so um, we are um, in company with pretty much every other university in dealing with this problem of inflation and exorbitant journal co um, costs. And um, when you put those three things together, that's why we're in this really tough situation of making such deep and broad cuts. We firmly believe that every researcher and student and staff will be impacted in one way or the other, given the depth and breadth of these cuts. And we regret that we were not afforded the opportunity to seek your feedback prior to making these cuts. Because the cuts are so deep and broad, it would not be prudent for us to ask you to cut 99 out of 100 titles. That's just not a, a very productive process for us. 
And so this is unfortunate, but this is the reality of, of where we are. Um, recently, since the cuts were announced, I have had the opportunity to speak directly with um, the provost, chancellor, vice chancellor for finance. And we're really committed to finding a path forward. Um, and, and, and so um, things could possibly change in the future. But as of now, um, we're, we're planning to make this um, cut. And the final thing I wanna make clear is that the university library has been um, really struggling in this area for decades. And, um, and we've been protecting collections for years and years at the expense of our staffing and at the expense of our operating cost. And I really felt like um, that we can't do that anymore. We have done all that we can to protect the collections. And it's important that our staff are here because they make the collections available and accessible. And so, um, so we're, we're faced with really tough decisions, but I believe that um, we're at the point, at the tipping point now where um, our collections are really um, in a very precarious situation. And it will be challenging to help the university fulfill its mission because I believe that the library is the heart of the university. It's a, it's a key part of the research and academic enterprise. And um, the collections are critical for the research and teaching and learning of this university. So um, we're committed to getting all of you what you need. It might not be as fast as you've um, had it in the past, but we are committed to that. And we are finding new strategies and methods to do it. We are working with our um, peer institutions in the state through the UNC system. So all the other schools in the system, I speak with those directors. I'm working with Duke and NC State. I work with the Southeast Research Libraries. I work through a variety of consortia on these issues. And so I believe we're really well plugged in. This is a wicked problem that did not start overnight and it will not end anytime soon. And so not only are we really trying to figure out how do we get a way forward where the library has permanent sustainable funding, but also start to address and tackle those issues of exorbitant journal costs and how we as a university can begin that conversation of focusing on open access, open science, and um, data sharing and open source to find a path forward for the long term. So I'll stop there and I'll take any questions that you might have. All right, questions. We have a question from Arlene Metter. Does interlibrary loan with other universities shore up collections or is there not enough overlap? That's an interesting question. Um, as you all probably know, interlibrary loan has been around for quite a long time. Um, the challenge we have here is we are shifting many of our costs to interlibrary loan because we are requesting far more titles now than we ever had. In the past, UNC Libraries was an organization that sent more titles, that sent more articles to other universities, and now it's flipped. Now we're on the requesting side. And so we are investing more resources into interlibrary loan and to rapid delivery of articles. And, um, and we'll have to see how that plays out. I mean, the beauty of libraries is we're built on a foundation of collaboration. And so our peer institutions at Duke and NC State um, have, you know, they want to help us. And I would do the same for them if they were subjected to the same kind of cuts. So that's kind of, I hope that addresses your question of, um, you know, how interlibrary loan works. Other questions? No? Nope. Here's one from Matthew Teal. Can we negotiate prices collectively as the UNC system or even more broadly to try and get the prices down? It's a great question. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, all the schools and units in the UNC system operate independently. And although we often 
negotiate with vendors as a consortia, we are all responsible for our own licenses. And so there's no one license for Elsevier, there's no one license for Oxford and these other ones. Um, and that is, that is part of the pickle we're in, is that um, these publishers, these multinational corporations that are pretty much controlling scientific publishing um, really are in the driver's seat and they are um, essentially dealing with each university, setting the price for each university um, independently. And so it's very hard to compete because we don't know what Duke is paying. We don't know what NC State is paying. And we all have to negotiate in separately on our own terms. All right, we've got a question coming up here. Danko. Um, yeah, I, I, actually, just to kind of specifically address that, I was wondering, is there, uh, what, what's stopping y'all from just broadly sharing that information between different library systems? I, I mean, I, I get that currently you're kind of negotiating blind is, I mean, kind of in a, a unionizing model, would it be possible to reach out to other massive systems such as yourselves to figure out what they're doing? Because if, if I mean, in kind of in a similar way that the medical field did the clear pricing project, is, is it possible that more information would create transparency and possibly more equity? Um, that's a very logical question, but again, um, I'm in conversations with libraries all over the world. And unfortunately, we are in a licensing arrangement with these publishers that doesn't allow us to work with other units to bring down the prices. Um, and it sounds like for the lawyer, you know, you're wondering about antitrust. Yes, antitrust is one of those big questions that come up. But um, we have been talking about this for the past 30 years, and we still don't have a solution. And if it were easy, we would have figured it out by now. And so there is, the questions you're raising are very logical. It's just that this system is extremely entrenched and it is also based on a model of prestige. And so because our scholars need promotion and tenure, they are willing to do a lot to get published. And, and we have a model where a scholar publishes an article Right, they're paid by the university, they're using taxpayer dollars, they publish an article, they give it away to the journal, and then the journal sell, sells it back to me for millions of dollars. So that's a racket, but that's the system that we have, right? And so when we talk about these issues, it's extremely complicated and complex, and it's not just a matter of finding the right price, because there's never going to be a right price when you are willing to do anything because you need promotion and tenure. And so again, I'm not trying to dump all of this in the lap of the researcher, but it's not just libraries are in this precarious situation, it's the whole higher ed. It's the researchers who are stakeholders and it's the taxpayers who are also stakeholders who fund the NSF and NIH um, and these universities as well. So I believe leaves a public university, we have a responsibility to make the research being produced at UNC Chapel Hill accessible to the world. And right now it's locked behind paywalls and that's unfair and it's unequitable and it needs to change. I do not think it will change in my lifetime, but I am committed to working on long-term strategies with the chancellor and the provost. And perhaps UNC could lead and be um, an exemplar to other um, universities. The University of California is doing an amazing job right now. Um, but the University of California is one system. And so you have 10 schools, one system. That is the only system of its nature in the United States. The SUNY system doesn't work that way. The Big Ten doesn't work that way. And so that's the disadvantage we have. We are one university that's forced to negotiate on one, on, on our terms per vendor, per publisher. And that's a very tough thing to be in, whereas the University of California is able to operate very differently. Sorry, that was a long response. <laughs> awesome. All right, any other questions? Well, we, we definitely really appreciate um, you coming by, Elaine, to, to give us the rundown on this situation. We're, we're here to support you. Let us know how we can help. Um, and we really appreciate the library's services here on campus. Y'all doing a fantastic job. So thanks for coming.
Thank you. I just, I just have one thing to say, which is if you have, um, I mean, the one thing that you could do to help is please let me know how you're being impacted. Um, that would be very powerful to us. Um, and we want to know how the library is of value to you. So if you don't want to reach out to me, please out to the liaison librarian who's assigned to your department. And they can help you get through some of these issues because um, this is a wicked problem and we need all of you to help. And staff are very much stakeholders in this process. And it's not just about faculty and students, staff use research, staff depend on the library. You all are key in the research enterprise and the academic enterprise. So um, let me know how you're being impacted. And the more information we have, the more we can help you. And, um, and I just appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group. And I welcome any of your feedback or comments afterwards via email or via Twitter. Thank you. All right, next up we have Director, Office of Emergency Management and Planning, Daryl Jeter, and Emergency Management Coordinator, Justin Miller on Emergency Management Plan and Preparedness here on campus. Let me pull up y'all's presentation real quick. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate today and to share with you some resources that we have for our campus community as it relates to emergency preparedness um, on our campus. Uh, as uh, was indicated, we're with the Office of Emergency Management and Planning with the university. And uh, we have worked in the past with a number of our colleagues that we see on today's call. Thank you for the work that you do for the university. And we trust that the information that we provide today will be of benefit to you. As an introduction, um, the purpose of our presentation today is really to create awareness around our campus emergency preparedness uh, concept and program, the Carolina Ready, um, Carolina Ready Campus Preparedness Initiative, um, and the resources that we have recently uh, made available for our campus community so that we can increase awareness as well as preparedness. So specifically, some of the resources that we'll be highlighting today are with respect to our emergency uh, action plan, our training, uh, both the computer-based training and then future initiatives as it relates to training opportunities that we'll have available. We'll also share where you can access safety guides and uh, our Carolina Ready Safety app. We'll talk a little bit about that resource um, as well. Before we go into that, I don't wanna take for granted that um, you are acquainted with uh, what it is emergency management uh, does um, and how we execute. And so when we talk about emergency management, we're really talking about a community effort, in this case, a campus-wide effort uh, to ensure uh, that uh, our campus is protected from the implications or impacts um, of an emergency or a disaster that may pose a threat to our campus community, whether it be a natural hazard, whether it be a human cause hazard or a technological hazard, we wanna protect those valuable assets, most notably our people, our students, our faculty, our staff, to the degree possible from the impacts of those uh, hazards that face our campus community. And our focus is on building a campus culture of preparedness and resilience. So knowing that we can't prevent every hazard from impacting our campus to the degree possible, we want to reduce its impact and then also we want to be a resilient campus so that we can bounce back and continue the great mission of teaching and research. 
doing so uh, through a number of methods on an ongoing cycle, whether it be prevention, protection, mitigation, re preparedness, response to recovery, in all of those elements and aspects of what we do in every core phase of emergency management, we want to execute activity that will contribute towards that overall mission. And I emphasize the we, because when you look at the composition of our office, the emergency management and planning office is a small staff, four staff members. And so obviously we can't accomplish this mission in a silo by ourselves, and that is not our intent. But well, we want to work collectively and collaboratively with our partners, as was indicated in the previous slide with the three C's, collaboration, cooperation, coordination, opportunities like this to share with you what it is that we do and to talk through how we can partner together to achieve those goals. And so with regard to our program, there are three key elements of our program uh, that, that we focus on. It's the plan development. And so all the different aspects that I uh, outline on the introduction is developing those plans and those processes and then training on them and exercising them to ensure that they are effective and that they match what uh, makes sense with not only today's time but also with the mission of the institution. And then after making sure that we go through the training and exercise component of that, when we do, uh, when we are faced with an emergency, uh, we put those plans to action. And so we execute during the response um, and the recovery. And you see the breakdown of the elements and components of each of those core areas. I do wanna emphasize as is relevant to our topic for today under the training and exercise, you know, our students, our faculty and our staff know you're not first responders and you don't necessarily have a direct uh, role in the response and the recovery but you can be aware and prepared so that you can safeguard, protect yourself and take care of your uh, fellow uh, employees uh, to assist us all in this combined effort of protecting our campus uh, community. With that said, the focus of today's conversation, Carolina Ready, what, what are we talking about when we speak of Carolina Ready? And we're really talking about a campus preparedness outreach campaign. It is collaborative in nature. And though we represent the Office of Emergency Management and Planning, I do want to note that what we're gonna share with you as it relates to the resources is really a collaborative effort and it's multidisciplinary in nature. And so we work with our other campus safety partners in, uh, at UNC Police, as well as Environment, Health and Safety. And collectively, our three areas uh, ensure that we have resources that speak directly to what would be of interest to our campus community based on the hazards that we know we would face. And so when we talk about being Carolina ready, we're really emphasizing three areas. We wanna make sure that you are informed, that you are prepared, and that you're prepared to take action. Being informed by knowing how the university is gonna to communicate to you in the event of an emergency or disaster, making sure that you are uh, signed up to receive Alert Carolina notifications and the other means by which we share updates with you. Being prepared by creating and making sure that you have personal plans. You can't help and assist others if you yourself aren't uh, protected. And so we want to emphasize individual preparedness and then campus-wide community preparedness. And then finally, again, when we're faced with those situations, being prepared to take action on those. That being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin Miller who oversees our campus preparedness program, who's gonna highlight the resources that we have available for you. All right, so we've been meeting right now for about an hour so far. Let's take a quick, a quick stretch break. Everybody here, stretch out. All right, everyone put, put your hands forward. All right. How about give me a thumbs up? All right, now let's everyone bend your arms. I'm gonna ask you a question right now. Who is responsible for your safety here at campus? You're pointing right at them. There we go. So what the emergency action plan does is, this is going to be your document to help give you the tools you need to be safe during the immediate impact of an emergency until the first responders can come uh, and take control of the scene. Um, brand, brand new document, we just launched this maybe about a month or so ago. Um, you can find this on the carolinaready.unc.edu website. 
what's this document is going to go through a, a bunch of different sections, you know, really, but no matter what happens on campus, if you know how to evacuate, get out of the building, or if you know how to shelter in place, that's going to be a, a good chunk of the different emergencies that could happen on campus. So definitely encourage you to re read through this document again to make sure that you're prepared for whatever could come. The training. Also this month, we just launched a brand, a brand new emergency preparedness 101 training uh, for employees, for all of us here. Uh, you can take the training on Carolina Talent. So just go, log on there, search for Carolina Ready. You'll be able to find it there. Um, af after you take it, you have a nice little pre-certificate that you can hang on your wall, you know, very proudly. Um, supervisors can assign it to their staff. Um, pieces like that. It's about a 20 minute long uh, program, but you're really going to take that um, emergency action plan and it really breaks it down for you, focusing, you know, on those, you know, those key actions, um, particularly, you know, how to help um, persons with disabilities, um, steps for them, and then how you could help them yourself. So definitely encourage you all to take that training. Uh, we, we are offer, offering an in-person hybrid uh, program as well. This is a partnership with UNC Police. Uh, environmental health and safety is fire safety program and then emergency management and what we'll do is we'll come into your building uh, do an assessment identify the, the uh, shelter locations um, we'll definitely where you have to go in assembly areas if there is a fire and we'll customize the training uh, to help you know keep you prepared in the your office space itself um, if you're ever interested in that um, we have the website the carolinaready.office.unc.edu again all of this is on the website and we'll make sure you receive uh, these slides afterwards to reference. Safety guides. We, we, we've, had a, we've had a busy, su busy summer putting together a lot of resources here for you. Um, we have a uh, employee preparedness guide uh, that you can go ahead and you, and you can download, a little two-pager, uh, lots of good information, um, you know, how to evacuate, how to shelter in place, um, some general safety tips here. Um, there is a... Um, Faculty and staff helping students. So these are a lot of resources provided by the Dean of Students Office um, on different um, conflict or other, you know, helping our students who are having some kind of, you know, emotional um, distress. So a good guide right there for you. Um, for faculty, if any of you do teach, we do have a preparedness in the classroom, you know, that we encourage our faculty to look at. It includes scripts and to read and information to provide to students in case an emergency were to happen in the classroom. Then we do have a student safety guide, uh, also downloaded lots and lots of good information, you know, generic student for being safe on campus, moving about, and a lot of other resources where they can get help. One, one of those resources, we launched this uh, last year, I think during the heart of the pandemic, so I think a lot of people missed it. Who's downloaded the app? No hands in the room. I see a couple, a couple on, online, that's good, good to see. Lots of different functionality. There's a lot here that are on the screen. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you read them. A, a couple key features here. Um, you, you, you see those blue uh, mobile, mobile uh, those blue lights across campus. You, know, you hit, you can get connected to place and they know your location. Well, now with the new app, you've got one right here in your pocket. Any, any given time you hit activate, you know, it will send your GPS location to our 911 center um, and then connect you with a call. So no matter where you're at, you're in a classroom, you're in your office, um, that is a resource for you. Um, you know, working alone, if you're working at late at night, um, you know, you, you, you can have the app check in on you. You know, if, if, if you don't check in, you know, accept the, uh, the push notifications like, hey, I'm okay, it will call your emergency contacts. Let them know that you haven't checked in. Um, you know, if you walk, walking late at night, lots of different options, a lot of different tips, a lot of the things, things that you see in the emergency action plan are also found here in this as well. So we encourage all faculty, staff, students, everyone, to use, to use this app, lots of good information. And then at the very end of it here, you know, to be Carolina, any questions, we have the carolinaready.office.unc.edu. All these resources, uh, carolinaready.unc.edu. Um, we encourage you to go check it out, see what's in there. Um, hopefully there's something else. If you have any comments or feedback on any of these products, you'll be the email address right up there. Um, we'd be happy to help um, you know, tweak, customize, uh, provide you with products that you all need. So, I'll pass off to Daryl for one last closing note. I do want to note that um, 
We do have your chair, Katie. She has downloaded the app, so great leadership on her end. Let's follow suit and download the app. Uh, also, I wanna note that we cannot predict uh, when something is going to impact us, but we can prepare. And so we invite all of us, let's join as a community. The time to prepare is now. Thank you again for the opportunity and I'll turn it over. Thank you, Daryl. Any questions? Not in the chat? All right. Okay, well, thank you both so much for coming and giving us this really helpful presentation. All right, so next up, as always, we've got Link Butler with our trusty HR updates. Link. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to see you all. Um, have a quick couple of quick updates, starting with the budget update. Um, I wish I had more information to share, and no doubt you've all been following it. Um, as of yesterday, the latest news article I saw about it was that there were still ongoing negotiations, but they still appear to be a bit far apart, um, which was a little discouraging to see, um, especially given the last couple of years and how the budgets turned out there. So I'm um, still hopeful, still trying to be the optimist that they will get a deal will get done soon and we'll have a budget and uh, that we'll be able to then get communication out about what that budget entails, and especially around um, employee salary increases. Um, so uh, again, I wish I had more information to share on the budget, but unfortunately they're still, still trying to hash it out um, at the legislature. So with that being said, um, you all no doubt know that last week we closed out our open enrollment for our benefits. Um, once again, it was a fast and furious uh, several weeks, um, but kudos to the Benefits and Leave Administration team for all the work they did in providing support to our faculty and our staff as they were navigating through that process. Um, uh, and again, uh, many of the, those NCFLEX uh, benefits elections that you've made during open enrollment, just as a reminder, take first at the first of the year. Um, also want to provide a reminder that the Carolina Cares, Carolina Shares campaign is underway. Um, we've, uh, like we do every year, we're leading the way in terms of um, donations. And uh, right now, doing a quick check to see exactly where we are. We are at $212,967 uh, committed or raised from the UNC Chapel Hill. The uh, next closest is NC State University at 140,000. So we're leading the way by a good bit, um, which we do every year. I'm so amazed at the giving um, uh, uh, of our faculty and staff and uh, the, the employee forum is a big part of that and getting the word out and also yourselves being active in the campaign uh, as team captains, as well as giving yourselves. So thank you for all the help around that. Um, Shereen Jenkins and Ari Ball in the human resources team um, have done a tremendous amount of work uh, with the, the team captains um, out there on campus and getting the word out uh, so that we can once again lead the way in giving. Um, and it goes without saying that this campaign impacts so many lives across North Carolina in so many ways. And so um, if you haven't given yet, I'd encourage you to consider doing so um, to the Carolina Cares, Carolina Shares campaign. Um, in addition to that, I uh, did wanna give a quick update um, Many of you know that we do have a design team that's working with the Operational Excellence Group to look at the future of work. Um, Katie is a part of that team, and uh, we have had a, uh, three sessions now that we've uh, been working on um, in honoring sort of the norms that we've set as the group. There's not a lot of detail that I can share with you yet, but um, just from what I've seen of this group and what I've been able to participate with, this is a highly engaged, highly motivated, highly passionate group of folks that represent all levels of the university from across campus um, that are looking at um, how, how has the pilot worked so far and how might we be able to develop some guardrails, some additional frameworks for what the future of uh, remote work flexibility might look like in the future. Um, again, we're working under a very tight time frame um, of trying to get some recommendations developed and pulled together uh, to be able to go out by the first of the year. I know the big question on everybody's mind is about the current pilot, will it be extended? Um, there still hasn't been a final decision made on that yet, but I know that there are some active conversations about that. We anticipate that it will be, um, not exactly sure how far uh, out it will be extended to allow any new recommendations that are adopted from the work of the design team 
uh, to be rolled out in terms of communication um, and then adopted by each of the schools, the, co the college, the divisions out on campus. So um, I'll actually put you on the spot, Katie. I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add about your experience with the design team. I would just echo your comments about being a really active and engaged group. Um, those three sessions so far, we've gotten a lot done. Um, so I look forward to continuing to work with that team. Um, and of course, allowing the, the forum to kind of lend their voices to that conversation as well. Um, kind of bringing our thoughts and voices to each of those design team meetings. So please reach out if you have any thoughts, questions, concerns, and I'm glad to forward them onto the group. Absolutely. And thank you, Katie, for your service on that group. Um, I didn't have a ton of updates to give today. I do want to hand it off to Jessica um, to provide her normal wellness updates. But before I do that, I would love to hear if there's any questions about anything I've shared or if there are other questions on topics that we haven't uh, touched on yet that I might be able to help with. Questions for Link, everybody. No questions in the chat. Any questions? That's rare. Nobody has okay. questions for Link. Wow. Okay. I see Arlene. Looks like she has her hand up. Oh, Arlene, your hand is up. What can we do to get the budget passed? This is a rhetorical question because I know there's nothing, but. <laughs> well, if I if I knew, um, maybe we could go into partnership and, and uh, figure out a way to make some money on that. But I, I wish I could tell you, I think, you know, being active with your voices with your legislators um, is a big way to try and influence um, what happens in the legislature. Um, and certainly in, in the context of the fact that the last two years, we've not had a final budget signed and we're still waiting and it's November 3rd now. Um, but certainly for those of you who are um, interested in doing that and reaching out to your legislators, I would certainly encourage you to do that. I wish I had a magic answer though, Arlene, believe me. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> All right, Jessica, I'll hand it off to you. It's all yours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Link. Good morning, everyone. So it is November already, so we are getting close to that holiday season, but I do want to take a moment to recognize that November is also Diabetes Prevention Month. So diabetes is still one of the leading causes of disability and death in the United States. There are 34 million Americans living with diabetes and one in three U.S. adults have prediabetes. So to help you take action, if you are at risk for diabetes, if it runs in your family, if you have any of the risk factors, you can take a little short quiz on the Eat Smart, Move More, Prevent Diabetes website here that I'll drop in the box. But there is a there's an essentially free program called Eat Smart, Move More, Prevent Diabetes. It is a 12-month program, um, very detailed to help people adjust their lifestyle style to either delay getting diabetes or to prevent it altogether through physical activity, diet, weight loss, and having that strong patient-provider um, relationship. So it's $30 to register, but people do get the full $30 back if they have good attendance and they meet the tracking requirements. And this program starts November 15th. There are afternoon sessions and evening sessions. They are weekly sessions, an hour long. Um, so I encourage you to check out that link in the chat. And then for our Wellness Wednesday webinars that we hold, we reached 125 employees last month in October with our four sessions. Our most well-attended session was overcoming negative thinking. So I just want to remind you again um, to be kind to others because sometimes we are our, our worst critics. So continue to spread kindness. And our least attended session was emotional eating, but still we had 24 people attend, um, which is not too far off from our average attendance of 26 people. This month, we have next week, a session on November 10th about sleep, an essential component of health and well-being. Just a reminder, this Sunday, you'll be turning your clocks back. So um, if you're interested in learning more about sleep, there is a session next Wednesday on the 10th. And then on the 17th, as we're approaching the Thanksgiving holiday, um, there's a session on gratitude for healthier, um, happier living. So I encourage you, if you want to start practicing gratitude, it's a great way to start your day. 
And those can all be found on the HR events calendar on the HR website. Then um, this month, unfortunately, the mental health first aid grant does come to a close. So if you've not taken this training, it is being offered throughout the end of this month. It is going to be virtual. It does require two hours of pre-work before attending this, the trainings, but they are being offered beginning next week, November 11th through November 23rd. Space for these sessions is limited, but I do encourage you to check this out if you've not completed this training. It helps you recognize someone who is in a mental health crisis, as well as teaches you appropriate ways on how to respond to that individual. So again, I'll drop that in the chat box. And then as we are approaching the holidays, there is a free program called the Holiday Challenge Maintain Don't Gain. Um, and that runs from November 15th through the end of the year. It is a seven week program and it provides you with newsletters, daily tips and delicious healthy holiday um, recipes. And that is provided through the Eat Smart Move More Way Less program. So I will drop that in the box as well. And I'll send these to Katie if that's easier. It works. And then I'm happy to let you know that the Jingle Bell Jog is resuming. Um, there will be an in-person Jingle Bell Jog, but there will also be um, an online virtual participation as well for those who aren't comfortable with getting together in person. Um, the Jingle Bell Jog will be held Friday, December 3rd at noon. The in-person location is Woolen Gym, so not at the Student Rec Center where it's been um, in previous years. And then again, you can sign up um, to participate virtual through the Strava app. And that's how they've been holding the challenges during, the, um, during this COVID time, but we are looking forward to coming together in person next month. And then a kudos for anyone who did not hear, um, see the article in the well, but there were two employees from UNC that received governor's awards for excellence this year. And those were Dr. Melissa Miller, the director of clinical microbiology and Mo molecular biology laboratories. She received the public service award for her efforts in the national and state levels to develop the rapid and accurate COVID testing program. So congratulations to her. And then former employee, Katie Bowler-Young, she was the um, Senior Director of Global Partnerships and Programs at UNC Global. She received the Outstanding State Service Award for her leadership and development of the first ever collaborative online international learning courses. So congratulations to her. Um, and I will, you, there are, quick two minute videos for each of the winners um, on the state website. So I encourage you to check those out and um, review the other winners as well. As far as our discounts that we're promoting this month, we did get several new gyms that are offering discounts to employees. So those include um, the Anchor Gym and Synergy Fitness for Her Gym and both in Durham and Burn Rate Fitness Gym in Mebbin. And the UNC, I don't want you to forget about your UNC discounts. It's $12 and 50 cents a month to join um, the Campus Recreation Center here. There is also a group fitness um, pass, which is $40 a semester. And that is prorated if you join later in the semester. And there are also a lot of fitness program discounts through the Blue 365 um, discounts that you receive for being a state health plan member. And then if you're traveling this um, holiday season and you have any concerns about home safety, you have a discount to ADT home security. Sorry, not a discount, but you receive a, a free doorbell, um, video doorbell or HD um, indoor camera plus a $200 visa virtual account. Um, and that is offered through Working Advantage. So I will drop that in the chat box too. Any questions for me? Questions for Jessica. And Jessica, yes, it would be great to send those resources to me and I'll forward them to the group. Sure, no problem. Afterwards. Questions? 
All right, well, it looks like we're all clear. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Link, for all of those great updates. Uh, we're gonna move on now to our consent agenda. Um, I'll start off by saying roll call, we're not gonna do. Um, it, otherwise, if you are joining via phone on Zoom or your name is not listed, make sure you put your name in the chat so Tiffany can capture your attendance. Um, would anybody like to pull anything from the consent agenda before we vote? Any committees that want to do updates, speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, can okay. education and career development do a super, super quick update? Yes, I will pull that from the consent agenda. We'll do that right after this. Any other committees? All right, entertaining a motion to approve the consent agenda, including the minutes from October. I think Matt sent those separately. Is that correct? Um, anyone motioning to do so? Jacob is moving that we do that any second. Laura, I mean, all right, all in favor. <laughs> I'll fight you for it, Arlene. <laughs> all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, consent agenda passes. Um, an update from the Education and Career Development Committee, Laura. Sure thing. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you saw the email that professional development grant applications are now open. We are excited to be able to entertain applications for travel, domestic travel, still not allowing international travel. Um, but if you have a conference coming up, spread the word with your colleagues, need a certification in something, it's a great opportunity uh, for you to receive up to $500 in funds. And hopefully if you haven't seen it, huge shout out to the well for highlighting previous winners of professional development grants. Um, and the fact that these grants will be open until 11.59 p.m. on the 14th. So don't miss out and spread the word. Anything else? Anything from Ellie? I don't know if Ellie is on the call. Ellie? That's all for me too. Thanks. All right. Well, next up we have old business, nothing there. Um, new business. Um, sadly, I have a announcement that Kevin, our trusty parliamentarian, unfortunately will be leaving us next month, but I wanted to bring this up now. We will have a vacancy in the parliamentarian role coming shortly in December. So this is my call now to start thinking about whether or not you will be interested in taking on the parliamentarian role. Don't be daunted, don't be scared. Um, Phil, who served in that role previously, has generously offered to help kind of transition anyone into the role if you're interested. So there is a resource you can lean on. Kevin, I'm just gonna say this, we're gonna miss you so, so much. Um, and you're always welcome at these meetings. Any questions about the vacancy? It, it will be starting in December. Um, so you have time to think about it. We'll do a quick kind of call for nominations at the floor at the December meeting. Um, I don't think we have to vote on it. Kevin, you can give your advice here of, of whether or not that's true, but I think I can appoint whoever expresses interest. So reach out over the next month or so if you have an interest in the role. Anyways, Kevin, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, all your service has been super, super helpful. Um, Kevin, do you want to say anything? Any words now? Not right now, no. <laughs> Thanks, though. <laughs> no problem, no problem. All right, like I said, reach out to me if you're interested. Um, glad to answer any questions. Same with, or if you have questions about the role, Phil or Kevin could answer them in the next couple of weeks as well. Awesome. Um, other announcements and questions, we'll get, um, I'm going to go ahead and do that before we get to our final special sh presentation for the day. Um, we talked about this last time, the November 20th, 2021 football game versus Wofford. The employee forum will be recognized on the field that day and delegates and their families will have tickets. Um, the sign up for those tickets ended October 29th. Um, I'm going to be sending out details to those who signed up for tickets um, about how to pick those up. I believe it's going to be at will call um the day of the game and i'll send details on when and where to meet for the field recognition 
Um, so more information on that to come in the coming couple weeks before the game. And then we have a vice chancellor representatives meeting coming up on December 9th. So be thinking about any uh, comments or questions you wanna add for that discussion. Awesome, any other new business anyone wants to bring from the floor? Well, with that, I'm gonna welcome our final special presentation for the day, Professor Tara Boley, who's gonna speak about the mental health first aid training, which we're all really excited to hear from her. Tara, come on up. You here? No? Is she on a Zoom? So can you tell if she's on Zoom? might not be on yet because it, her presentation is supposed to start at 11. With that said, we've got time for other committee updates. Anybody else want to do an update? Communications, public relations? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if we have too much to update, but on 15 minutes, but uh, <laughs> we, um, you know, the, the latest issue of In Touch went out uh, a couple weeks ago, I think now. Um, please read it, send feedback if you like. And if you want other things featured in In Touch, uh, please let me know and uh, we'll include it. Awesome, book club, any updates for book club? Um, community service, Jacob, any updates from you? You wanna come up to the, the microphone. <laughs> take your time, take your time. There's a Tara in there. All right, updates from Jacob. Yeah, uh, we don't have too many updates to be totally upfront. We have uh, um, connected with the, uh, the UNC Children's Hospital. We are planning on doing another toy drive this year. Um, we're currently looking to get uh, their list of needs and wishes, their, their little wish list. Uh, I think they're gonna be doing something from Amazon in case people are still wanting to contact us. I understand there's a lot of folks coming back from their children who we don't want to necessarily, who are gonna be minimizing on campus. Um, however, kind of in anticipation of folks wanting to return a little bit more to normal, um, I would appreciate anybody who wants to help either host a drop-off location or has done drop-off locations in the past reaching out so we can kind of start getting that ball rolling ahead of time so that way people can access it. We'd greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Somebody had a question in the chat. Is there a blood drive date? Yes, it's December 8th. It's a There's Wednesday also, this year. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Two things. Uh, Elizabeth wants Kevin's shirt. And <laughs> the other thing is, I believe James may have a Chancellor's Building and Grounds Committee update. Awesome. James, you want to come forward with that update? Thanks, Jacob. James Damey, you ready? Okay, maybe not. Um, community Garden, Arlene, any updates there? We had our first meeting in so long. Um, the people from Aveda and Aveda's parent company, Nurture, were there. They are now serving on the advisory committee for the garden. Um, and I don't know if everyone missed it, but Nurture, Aveda's parent company, has a $6,000 grant over like the next five years for the garden. So, yay! <laughs> um, and the garden, despite the fact we didn't have our usual event, did hand out um, tomato plants and I think pepper plants this past spring to people. So the, the work is ongoing. Okay, I have James's update. Great. He's having audio trouble today. The update is signage approved for 90th anniversary of School of Government, signage approved for Genome Sciences, McCall Building, re renovations, and expansion approved. 
Excellent. All right, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Is Antonio on the call? I am. Um, so the only update that we have is Matt came to speak to us in our last committee meeting to talk about proposed um, sustainability committee or subcommittee and if we could, um, if it could work under um, the Employees Forum Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So we decided to do a trial run to see if it can work. Um, so they're going to, um, Matt has um, gotten together a group of members from the employee forum um, BI committee to kind of work through it to see if it's something that they it could to see if it's something that can work and if so uh, or if not he's going to come and talk to us a little bit about it in February. All right um, Adriani had an update in the chat and we are working um, to bring our alternative holidays resolution to the staff assembly. Um, it is now a joint resolution with the DEI Council, which is excellent news. Um, so we're going to be bringing that to the Staff Assembly Chairs meeting this coming, well, one of these Thursdays in November. I can't remember exactly what day it is. Um, so we'll be presenting it there. Um, hopefully they will sign on to it as well. Joe, your hand is up. Is there something else in the chat? Okay. Um, any other updates for DEI? No, that's all at this time. Excellent. Um, any updates um, from membership and assignments, Tiffany? Okay. Personnel issues, is Stephanie or Matt on the call? Sorry, no, I don't have any updates. <laughs> Couldn't find my button. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, hey, Katie, no updates from personnel issues yet. Nataya, recognition and awards. Okay. Rules committee, Kevin, any rules you want to talk about? <laughs> no, we don't have any updates. <laughs> um, staff assembly is Shana. Um, I think Keith is on a phone call right now. James, Laura, anyone want to give an update on staff assembly front? Sure, I will give an update. Um, I don't have a big one, but um, we have a new staff assembly chair, uh, Crystal Woods, who's out of school of science and math. Um, I believe she has a two year term. Is that right, Katie? Sorry, what did you say? Does she have a two year term? Is that correct? Um, I think so. I don't know exactly how it works, but there's like, like a chair does. elect, there's a full chair. Yeah. Like, I don't know exactly how the process works, but I yeah. think it's. But she's a new chair. She just got started uh, last week, in fact, um, and we had our November meeting, which was really productive, um, including HR updates from Matt Brody, which I believe Katie sent out, um, and then some goal setting the second day, setting goals about what we want to see the staff assembly do in the coming year. Um, Crystal has also made a point to meet with each and every um, institution of all of 17 institutions and their representatives for staff assembly. So we just had our meeting with her yesterday. Um, so she's got a lot of energy. I think she um, is on board with wanting to see staff assembly be proactive as opposed to reactive. That's one of the things that we talked about yesterday. Um, yeah, is there anything else that I'm missing, Katie? No, I think that was a pretty good update. Cool. Um, uh, Katie. Yes. Can you can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, yeah, Laura pretty much covered everything. Um, just to clear just a clarification on like Crystal's terms. It's it's kind of funny. It's actually a four year term. So she's done one year as incoming, and then two years she'll be um, chair, and then there's another year that she does as outgoing. So it's it's kind of it's just a little wonky, but yeah, um, Laura covered it all. We're good. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks, Keith. You're welcome. Uh, hey, Kevin. Let's see here. Transportation hey, park. Hey, Keith. Yeah. 
Transportation and parking, any updates there, Laura? I don't think that's me anymore. I think no, someone else, anymore. yeah. I don't think they've met, so I don't think we have updates. They weren't meeting a whole lot this past year, but I think in one of our recent meetings, I could go back and look at the notes, but I think in one of our recent meetings, someone else showed interest in which I gladly handed the torch over. I just can't remember who that person was. I do not either. Um, Carolina Peer Support Collaborative, uh, Joseph or Natalia, any updates there? Joseph might not be on the call either. Um, Policy Review Committee, Phil, any updates there? Uh, yeah, I guess I was remiss in um, forwarding around the policy being discussed at the October meeting. Um, I'll, I'll include it in the November um, update as soon as uh, Jen sends that around. Um, the, the October update was basically sort of streamlining the um, workflow and approval process for um, independent contractors or community um, uh, community members who work in partnership with UNC um, based around some specific needs to make that process a little bit faster with a little less sort of approval oversight. Um, uh, anyhow, it's uh, for folks who work with independent contractors and paying folks from the community, it's probably something that impacts your work. But um, again, I'll, I'll pass around the policy so you know that something changed. Um, but looking forward to the November meeting at a date, which I do not have in front of me, but I assume it will happen and you'll get a big update from me at that point. Um, any questions or comments, feel free to let me know. Perfect, thank you, Phil. Um, last but not least, Student Stores Advisory Committee. We have two new delegates that are serving in that capacity. David Bragg and Evan Marsh were newly named to that group. I don't know that they've met yet. I don't know if either David or Evan are on the call, um, but they are excited to get working, I'm sure. Awesome. We have not met yet. I figured as much. Thanks, David. And Phil or Matt brought to the chat PRC meeting is November 11th. Cool. All right. Well, Professor Tara Boley on mental health first aid training. Welcome. Come on forward. We're going to start with that presentation now. I'm going to pull up your presentation. I think that's set up. You can use the toggle advance that way. to advance it that way. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. I, this is, I realized the first time I presented in a mask, so I actually might have <laughs> sort of chosen Zoom, but um, can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right. So I brought some slides to give an overview of what mental health first aid is so that uh, I cannot assume that you know what the course is. Uh, when I was invited to be here, though, I did have a caveat. We've been uh, providing this training on campus through the School of Social Work for six years now. I can't believe it, but it's been six years. Trained over 3,000 people, and we're at a bit of a crossroads with the program. Uh, we've been doing this through uh, two federal grants that have provided the funding for it, and that second grant ends uh, Thanksgiving week. So we have, we're planning to kind of wrap things up and, 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 and move on to a different project. And wow, September hit and everything changed. And that was a culmination of a long time coming. And so, although at one point I'm, and I was ready to kind of move into a different project and say, okay, I've uh, done mental health first aid, do something else, um, now's not the time to stop. So I'm excited to say that we've submitted a proposal for continued funding. I'm very confident there will be continued funding, um, but that will probably start again in the new year. So with that being said, it's never too late to go ahead and talk about what this is. And I'm guessing, I saw there were about 75, 83 people, fantastic, <laughs> on Zoom. Um, and I bet there is a good portion of people who are mental health first aiders already. Fantastic. So. Um, for those of you that want to chime in, please do. Um, and I will save hopefully a little bit of time for questions at the end, and I do plan to stick around. So let me just start with an overview of what it is. Oops, wrong keyboard. Just like CPR and regular first aid, mental health first aid is simply the assistance that's offered to a person who might be having early 
signs and symptoms of a developing problem related to their mental health or substance use, or how to intervene if you find yourself in a situation where someone is having a crisis related to a mental illness or substance use. And so it's really about helping the layperson know what to do in those situations until professional treatment can arrive, until a first responder can come on the scene, or until that person can utilize the tools to help themselves. So why do you think we need mental health first aid? Well, there are four primary reasons that I can think of. And so the first one is that they're common. The fact is that we know throughout the course of a person's lifetime, if a person is going to develop a mental health disorder, 50% of them do so by age 14. 75% of people who go on to develop a mental health disorder do so by age 24. And guess what? Across the span of our lifetimes, half of us will develop the criteria that's necessary to meet the diagnosis of a mental health condition or substance use disorder. So mental health problems, substance use problems are very common. We also know if you think about that 75%, that age range, 14 to 25, is the most vulnerable age range of any point in our lifetime for developing a mental health problem. Guess where those people are? About half of them are somewhere in a higher education setting. So they're right here on campus. And what we know is the quicker we can intervene, the quicker a person can get identified as having something that might become a problem later, the better their outcomes. We also know that the more people understand and are aware of what are signs and symptoms and can help a person get connected to the right type of help, the better the opportunities that person has to get that help and to have better outcomes. Additionally, we know that if we are mentally well, we are in a better position to be able to help others. So the more people we have on campus who understand what it takes to stay well, to get well, to be well, and what it takes to get help when we need it, the more the culture can possibly change as well. So we also know one reason we need mental health first aid, the second is stigma. And when we talk about the stigma associated with mental health disorders, we're really talking about two types of stigma. There's the stigma that's in the communities, that's in the messaging. I can't help but think about the Halloween season we're in right now. How many movies have we watched recently that were about the deranged individual, the, the, the crazy person that's kept in the attic that goes bananas and kills everyone, right? Well, why do we have stigma? Hmm. So the messages are everywhere. If you have a mental health condition, if you have a mental illness, you're dangerous, right? You shouldn't be given responsibility. You won't be able to have, maintain a job, maintain, keep your children. You'll have to go to the hospital. You have to have medication. But then there's also that internalized stigma that we take for granted. Those questions of what does it mean if I go see a therapist? What does it mean if I'm diagnosed with schizophrenia? Am I Norman Bates? What does it mean if I have to take medication every day? What does that mean? Because I'm supposed to be able to pull myself up by my bootstraps, right? I should be able to deal with this, right? So there's internal stigma as well. Third reason we need mental health first aid is because we know that about 40% of people who meet the criteria for a diagnosis of a mental health condition or substance use disorder are not getting treatment for it. So we also recognize that many times people aren't seeking help when they need it. And yet, the implications of that affect all of us. People who don't get help or don't seek out support for themselves frequently get worse. They miss work. They stop maintaining their responsibilities. There are consequences for that. And those consequences impact families, they impact children, they impact the workplace. 
and we were all kind of affected by that. We also know that untreated mental health conditions can lead to severe and chronic mental health conditions. And if those things continue, a person with a severe mental illness lives on average 25 years less than a person who doesn't have a severe mental illness. We also know that by far, the majority of people who die by suicide had a mental health condition many times untreated. Lastly, we know that people with severe mental illnesses, despite the myth that they're the ones causing the violence, are actually 11 times more likely to be victims of violence. And the last reason, why do we need mental health first aid? Because when people don't know what to do, they're afraid they're gonna make it worse and they don't do anything, which makes it worse. So the more we can train people how to just notice, how to intervene, how to do something, or just to express empathy, just to express concern of, I see you, you appear to be struggling. I'd like to help. Would you allow me to help you? The more we have opportunity to really make that difference. What Mental Health First Aid trains is what are some of the risk factors and warning signs of, of the more common mental health conditions? And not all of them are diagnoses. Sometimes it's just understanding what is psychosis? What does it look like when a person may be exhibiting early signs of psychosis? What is the difference between depression versus feeling depressed? What are some things that a person may be saying, doing? Uh, what are some things you might notice about their routine? Sharing information about how those uh, can develop into disorders and what that looks like and some of the implications and what crises might be a result if it's not treated or addressed. People learn a five-step action plan that they can walk away with. And I see some nods. People know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you learn a real skill set of tools of what to do in those situations. And then also that there's a, a large list of resources in terms of information and referrals that people can get to get more information to help themselves if they're not interested in professional treatment or they're not ready for professional treatment. That's just one option. Mental Health First Aid also has several different iterations. There's supplements specific to populations like older adults, rural populations, higher education. Uh, there's a Spanish curriculum and also a separate curriculum for youth. This is key. Where does mental health first aid fit in? Is it prevention? It's not treatment, we know that. Is it crisis intervention? And it's really that early intervention. If you think about the spectrum of a person becoming being well on this side and having a crisis here and then recovering, we know that mental health first aid is kind of in that sweet spot of opportunity, recognizing something's different about this person and helping that person maybe see it if they don't, and then also uh, get the resources that they need to try to become well again if they're not. Sorry about this slide, it's a little off there. <laughs> the big takeaway from mental health first aid is we have to offer hope. Mental illness is not a life sentence. Substance use disorders are not life sentences. People can and do recover. The more likely a person is to identify that they need help or they're struggling or something's not right, the more opportunities they have to seek resources in the community, within their family, uh, within the professional environment, the more likely they are to achieve recovery and continue to live fulfilling lives. Just gonna leave you with a couple of testimonials. We get unsolicited comments from participants of this training frequently about how, wow, actually last week I was training and somebody said, I just used mental health first aid in an email to a student while we're on this training. <laughs> that was definitely the quickest application. The people will say they've used it the day after, the next week, 
And you don't just use it at work. You don't just use it here at Carolina. You use it in your household. You use it at the grocery store. You use it at the salon getting your hair done. <laughs> Had somebody say they used it as an Uber driver. You never know the opportunity you're gonna have to really make a difference. So with that being said, I, I'm happy to ask questions. I will let you know, um, since uh, October 15th through the end of November, we have 20 events planned. They're all full. Uh, we are training 500 people in that six week period. So we are really trying to do as much as we can in that last hurrah. We are also taking a wait list of individuals and departments who have asked for the training so that we can have that ready to go um, after, after the new year and really reach out to everyone with a news blast, an email blast about the opportunity and what that will look like. Perfect. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'll, I guess I'll start off with the questions. Um, so you do, you mentioned department trainings. You do department trainings with individual departments. Is that right? Yeah, we get a lot of requests from departments, particularly, um, actually, we just did one with uh, Lineberger Cancer Center, uh, who's doing the, the, the studies, the staff supporting the studies. Um, we've done a lot of library staff. Uh, have asked us for to train their departments, teaching assistants or another group. But yes, as we can accommodate schedules, we do that. What What is the number of people that you would typically ask to participate in a department level training? So we can only have 30 in an event, but if a department only has 12 people, that's fine. We can try to open those other spaces up to the community and fill that to 30. Thank you. Yeah. Questions from the chat room. We have two questions from the chat. The first is, if we've taken the mental health first aid course, how do we get renewed? Oh, sorry, it scrolled down. How do we get renewed or do we need to take it again? You have two options for that. You can take the course again and things have changed in three years. Um, most of the content's the same with just some updated statistics or there's also an online recertification option. Um, if you wanna email me, that's probably the easiest way, tboley at email.unc.edu and I can send you the link for recertification. They do send participants an email about recertification, but sometimes that gets blocked in spam. So I'm happy to do that. I think there's a, a $30 fee, but it's, it's only about a 30 minute online training. So it definitely is more quick than the eight hour approach. I think that would be helpful for those of us like me that took it like four years. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to send it if you want to you and you can share it with the forum. Great, thank you. A question from Elizabeth. If the grant is running out and spaces are already full for many of the days offered, will the grant be renewed in order to provide future sessions? So my hope is that it won't be grant funded in the future. My hope is that at this point, uh, the university is ready to fund it itself. And I believe that is the case. I've gotten a lot of uh, interest from administration uh, and the school is definitely, School of Social Work is definitely uh, wanting to continue the program and continue this, this model. We've, we've been fortunate that there are instructors in other parts of campus. Uh, we have certified instructors in student wellness and in Eshelman School of Pharmacy, Adams School of Dentistry. So, and Campus Police actually has an instructor. So we've been partnering with instructors all over campus and that's been really uh, nice as well. Okay, there's one more, but I believe we answered it. Um, I'm a mental health first aider since 2018 through this program. Do we have to do any other continuing training to stay current? Nope. Nope. You're good for three years. And uh, that's, that's all there is at this point. And also, Phil put the link to an e-certification for mental health first aid in the chat. If oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Anything else from the chat? That's it. Any other questions live from the floor? Any of our participants? Raise your hand. No? All right, well, I guess I have a final question. Um, so there's been a lot of new initiatives in the, the recent, the wake of the tragedies on campus. Um, Heals Care Network, I think is one of them. Um, there's several others that have kind of sprouted out of this and there's the upcoming summit on mental health that's, that's happening this month. Um, is your group partnering with some of those efforts? How do they kind of interlap or intertwine? 
Yeah, interestingly enough, the grant that funded this second three years of the project was a Garrett Lee Smith Campus Suicide Prevention Grant. So mental health first aid was just one component. Um, some of the other work that that grant allowed us at the School of Social Work to do was to work on a comprehensive approach to suicide, which includes postvention, crisis intervention, many, there are nine steps to that. And so I am pleased that we are a part of those conversations and recognizing that there's more than just responding after something happens, but there's a lot that we can do to change our culture and to really work on establishing it. And I'm, I'm happy to be here because I think staff are key in this. Staff have actually been the largest group to take mental health first aid. And so you all many times are the front lines of the public, the faculty, of the students. You are very important people on this campus. <laughs> and so um, recognize that it's more than just students' well being. It has to be a culture, and we have to really have an environment that supports that and resources available for both. I guess a follow up to that, the, the forum has a presence on the Carolina Peer Support Collaborative that was developed, I think, here in the School of Social Work. Um, do you all work with that team as well? Because there's people from across campus that serve on that and kind of bring forward thoughts and ideas around um, peer support. Practically have Dr. Fisher and Samantha on speed dial. Yes, we are connected. <laughs> and there, that work is wonderful. It's been, it's really taken off and couldn't have been come at a better time. So I'm very, very pleased with that time. Great. Thank you again for coming out and for giving this presentation. It's, I know it's sorely needed right now. There's, there's definitely some struggling happening on campus, um, both for students, but for staff and faculty as well. So we're very appreciative of this training of this resource that's available on campus. So thank you for coming out today. Thanks. We have one more question. Yeah, one more question. From Arlene, so maybe two more questions. Has there been a big response among first responders to take this training? Yeah, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the groups that we weren't able to accommodate, or there's a, there's a student group of EMS on campus who wanted to, us to come and train. And I think we're gonna figure out a way to do that, but. Um, there have been a lot of, of requests like that. So yes, absolutely. Did I answer the question directly? Okay. Yeah, my question was um, just if there was anything that we as staff or employees could do to kind of help further support getting more solid commitments from the university. There's been a lot of discuss. I know that recently there was an announcement of like a, like a million dollar grant that was planned for mental health and awareness. I was just wondering if there was anything else that we could further do to show our support of that initiative and how valuable we think it is. Cause I think this year has proven its necessity. I don't have something, you know, concrete to, to say. I will say the three page list of testimonials is wonderful. Uh, you know, we're in an academic institution. So I hear a lot of show me the data, show me the outcomes. Well, they're there. Uh, Mental Health First Aid, if you go on their website, the national international group, the evidence is there. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at Carolina's data for sure that, I mean, we've got a lot of information and going forward, but I think one of the biggest things that we've, we've had specifically when we had one primary trainer for six years, Jody Flick, who probably trained most of you all, um, she had such a information bank of what's going on on campus between faculty, staff and students. I don't know that anyone really had that same perspective and so as we move forward with these initiatives, with the summit, um, with um, you know, the new resources that are available and with mental health first aid, I really look, hope that we'll look holistically at that information and use it to just um, you know, develop a culture of care, uh, caring for other people, attending to other people, paying attention to other people, in our vicinity and really um, more compassion and empathy. So keep the testimonials coming, even though it's not, um, you know, it's definitely anecdotal in ways. Uh, as a trainer, uh, training this curriculum over and over and over again, for a lot of trainers, they would say, oh my gosh, how do you train the same thing over and over again? Well, I probably couldn't for any other course, but this course I can, because I see the change happen. I see it in the participants. I see the wheel spinning. I have people come up, come after and talk to me and tell me that their stories or tell me this aha moment that they had. 
and the door signs all over campus are you know, visible statements saying that we get it and we want to help. And we're all human and we're all carrying this together. We're all going through this together. We're just at different places at different times. So, so keep those coming. Thank you. So it is also my sincere hope that they fund this program. I, I was at an event recently where President Hans from the system came and spoke, and he talked about how COVID relief money um, came to the system and that a lot of system schools are using it for mental health concerns and shoring up kind of the, the gap on campuses. So hopefully they use some of that money and other recurring money to kind of support yeah. this program because that's your program is invaluable. So thank, thank you. you. I, I will say too, I've had really exciting um, ideas from people who've taken the training. I had one uh, person just this week say, oh, we want to start putting this on the syllabus so people know that it's a resource for them. And um, so a lot of people are taking it. I'm actually meeting with another group of staff who said, you know, we deal with the public in these stressful situations. We would really like to have a, a suicide protocol for how, what we do when a person is in our department or office is suicidal that we're serving. And so I'm going to help talk to them about maybe coming up with something for them. And again, that's not an academic setting per se, and they're not talking about students, but I think it's really, uh, there's a lot of really innovative things being done in departments and organizations. We have one more question. Uh, Laura Pratt asked that you, asked if you will share this presentation with us. Absolutely, yeah, I can take And that. create some PDFs from this presentation, sure. All right, all right, well, thank, thank you, you so much. much, Tara, for coming out, appreciate it. y'all any final thoughts questions before we close for the day well i think i have a few things to share with y'all afterwards the resources that uh, jessica provided in her wellness update um, the slides from tara's presentation and also the slides from the campus um, safety um, emergency planning presentation we had earlier. I will send those to y'all shortly. Phil, your hands up. I just wanted to ask while folks are still here, um, if anyone would like to be the voice of the chat, and thanks to Joe for being there today um, to um, help communicate some of these questions. Uh, if anyone has interest in that, um, feel free to drop it in the chat or reach out to Katie um, Jacob, just to make sure that happens. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate it. Awesome. Love it. All right. Well, any uh, a motion to adjourn? Arlene moves to adjourn. Any seconds? Laura seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Great to see y'all. Have a great rest of your November, although I'm sure I will be seeing y'all in the interim. Thanks, everybody. Stay warm, y'all. <laughs>